buying an iPad right now is potentially the most complicated it's ever been. Not only is the lineup absolutely massive, but each iPad has its own features and hardware differences. And if you decide to spec them up in any way, all the prices start overlapping, which just makes the whole process honestly a bit of a nightmare. So today I'm going to try my best to guide you through the entire iPad range and pick out the right one for you. Before we jump in though, there's a few things which are really worth knowing. One is all of these iPads run quick. You're not gonna buy one and be like, oh, why is it so slow? They're all quick, they're all speedy, and they all work absolutely fine. Secondly, they all run the same apps as of now, so you're going to be able to run any app on any iPad, and it's going to be absolutely fine, with a very few tiny exceptions, but otherwise they all run the same apps. They all have cameras on the front and on the back, and all the front-facing cameras include the face tracking center stage, so it will track your face whenever you're in a video call, which is really useful. They all support universal control and sidecar, so if you have have a Mac, you can control it with your Mac, or if you want an extra screen for your Mac, they can all do that too, which is awesome. And finally, and this is kind of an overarching thought for the entire video, if an iPad is going to be your only computer, I strongly suggest you look at getting a laptop instead iPads are fantastic and I really, really love them, but the price will start jumping up very quickly in this video. And if you're getting into that kind of higher range, then a laptop is going to be a better overall general computing device. Also throughout this video, I'm going to put up my iPad graph, which should help you decide which iPad to go for. I'm gonna put them all into categories so you can easily see which one you should go for. And I'll leave a link for that below as well so you can view it at any time. But all that aside, let's get right into it. Let's start right at the bottom of the iPad 9th gen. And honestly, this is still a pretty decent iPad at the moment. The A13 chip in there, which is a couple years old now, still runs iPadOS really, really nicely. And when I reviewed it about a year ago, I was pleasantly surprised at how well it still ran in general. And it is the only iPad left with the old design which also in turn means it has a home button, which you can press to go home, which some people still like, and it still has a headphone jack, which no other iPad or iPhone has right now. The screen on here is nice, but it is unlaminated, which means there's a bit of an air gap between the glass on top and the screen on the bottom. And because of this older design, you're only getting bottom firing speakers, which sound a bit tinny, and they don't get massively loud. You are getting Apple Pencil first gen support on here, which is nice, and you can pick up an iPad Folio keyboard from Apple, which is decent, so it's got some good accessory support. It does start at 64 gig, which is a little bit low, but you know, potentially at this sort of end, that's okay. And this is the cheapest iPad overall. It starts at 369 pounds here in the UK, and once you add in a pencil and a keyboard, you can kind of get this full system for about 650 pounds, which isn't too bad. If you ask me, I think the right is on the wall for this iPad though. It's not gonna stick around for much longer. There's already an iPad 10th gen and all the other iPads have moved on to the newer design with USB-C and all of those sorts of things. So unless Apple turned this into an iPad SE, I think I would try and avoid it as best as you can. Plotting this into the graph though, I would say this is still good for students because you've got the pencil and keyboard support and it's good for general consumers as well that just want a little tablet to use for watching things or consuming stuff. Okay, next up, let's move on to the iPad 10th gen. This is the new standard iPad. So looking forward, this is what they're kind of all going to look like. And it is a bit of a strange one because there's lots of weird hardware things with it and lots of stuff which kind of doesn't make sense on the surface. But when I reviewed it, I actually ended up really liking it. So let's talk about it. The iPad 10th gen does have this new design with a liquid retina display, which is lovely. That display is still not laminated though, so there is that small air gap, but you'd be hard pushed to see it. This is also the only iPad with the front facing camera in the right position. It's in the middle of the iPad, not on the side. So when you're having a voice call, you appear in the center of the frame and not off to one side. You get USB-C with this one, which is awesome, and also a bunch of colors to choose from, which is always nice. You're getting the A14 chip in here as well, which is a bit of a bump up from the A13, and this performs really nicely. Again, it's hard to really notice with iPadOS when things slow down because it happens so rarely, but this still runs really, really nicely. Your base starting storage here as well is 64 gig, which again, I think is a little bit low, but this is still considered an entry level iPad. Let's talk about the weirdness of this iPad though. Despite this having a new design, it's still using the first generation of Apple Pencil. And because that first generation of Apple Pencil uses a lightning connector, you can't connect it directly to this iPad. 
you have to buy a USB-C to lightning connector to get the pencil connected up and then you can use it and that's the only way to charge it as well which is really strange. This iPad does have its own folio keyboard from Apple which is absolutely fantastic. It kind of breaks off into two pieces and you can connect it in loads of different ways and it's arguably the most pro level keyboard because it's got a function row amongst some other keys but it only works on this iPad. So it's like the most pro level keyboard on the kind of entry level iPad it doesn't work with any other iPad, which again, is just really odd. But all of these things, you know, contained are awesome. This starts at £499 here in the UK. But once you add the keyboard and a pencil, you can jump well up into the 800s. And this is where I really think it's worth considering moving to kind of a MacBook Air or something like that. You're in a similar price range now. And a MacBook Air, especially if you end up getting a pre-owned one with the M1 chip, they're absolutely incredible and you'll get a little bit more for your money as well. Okay, plugging this into the graph, I think this is good for students and for consumers. And I would also put it into the creator area as well because you've got the pro level keyboard here, the pencil support is still good and it's got plenty of power to keep it going for years as well. Moving up the pricing scale, we actually get onto the iPad mini and I'm kind of dubbing this one the Goldilocks iPad because it kind of works for absolutely everybody on kind of any scale. And it's the least confusing of this entire range because of its size. If you want a small iPad, this is the only way to go. And it's a beautiful little thing as well. This inherits the Pro and Air designs and it's literally just shrunk right down. You get a bunch of color choices here, which is always lovely to see. You're getting USB-C, you're getting Apple Pencil Generation 2 support, which snaps to the side and charges up, which is just absolutely excellent. And you're also finally getting a laminated screen of this one, which just feels like you're touching the pixels on the screen. It's really, really great. Once again, the iPad mini starts at 64 gig, which I actually potentially think is okay for the smaller iPad, but you can boost it up to 256 if you feel like you need to. While you are getting Pencil 2 support, there's no kind of official keyboard from Apple, but you can find plenty of those on Amazon if you'd like to. But arguably, I'd say this isn't really the place to be typing out an entire essay or anything like that. I've actually just made a video on the iPad mini and why it's actually kind of the hidden gem of the entire iPad range. So I'll link that up here if you'd like to see it and I'll obviously pop it below as well. I would also say this is the best iPad for gaming. It's got the Apple A15 chip, which is the same one which is stood in the iPhone 14 series at the moment, which makes it really powerful. And if you combine that with the size and the fact that you can just hold it for ages without your hands or, you know, kind of arms getting tired, it's a really good little device for gaming. This one starts at £569 here in the UK and putting it into my scale is actually kind of impossible because it works for everyone. This one sits outside the scale as if you need a small iPad, then get this one. Let's look at the iPad Air now, and this is where things, in my opinion, start to get really exciting with iPads. In terms of design, we're getting the new squared off kind of pro design on the Air here with a slightly smaller 10.9 inch screen rather than an 11 inch. There's USB-C, there's a bunch of colors to choose from. We're getting the nice laminated screen, which is always great to see. But unfortunately, this iPad still starts at 64 gigabytes of storage, which I actually think is too low coming in at this price point. Also with the Air, you're getting access to the proper pro level accessories. So you're getting the Apple Pencil 2 support, which is great. Snaps to the side, charges up. We love that. But you're also getting access to Apple's Magic Keyboard. And this is arguably the best keyboard from Apple. This has that beautiful floating design and the iPad just snaps in and snaps off with the smart connectors. No problem at all. We're getting backlit keys and absolutely everything. It's a shame there's no function row, but this is one of the best accessories for iPad. And if you want to turn it into more of that laptop kind of replacement experience, you can with this accessory. The iPad Airs are now rocking the Apple M1 chip as well. And this is a huge leap in performance over the other iPads. It also means you're getting that coupled with eight gigabytes of RAM, which just kind of immediately puts it up into laptop territory in terms of power. Thanks to that M1 chip as well, you're getting more huge features. You're getting Stage Manager, which is proper windowed multitasking on the iPad, which is really nice. And you're also getting full external monitor support. So if you want a full desktop experience from your iPad, you can get that with the iPad Air and that all connects through the USB-C slot. Nothing in the lower range has this, so this really separates the Air and Pros above everything else. These iPads start at £669, but once you add in a pencil and the Magic Keyboard, you can happily spend over a thousand pounds, no problem. Again, this is when you should consider a laptop if you're thinking about only having one device. Plugging this into my graph, I'd say this goes beyond students and consumers, and this falls directly into kind of the creator and prosumer category. If you know you're going to make some money with this iPad, or if you know it's gonna be one of your main devices, then iPad Air is absolutely the way to go. They're really fantastic devices. 
Before we move on to the pro models, I did want to talk about today's sponsor, Paperlike. If you are thinking about picking up a new iPad and you want a way to not only protect your screen, but also enhance the feeling, then Paperlike might be for you. Paperlike is a screen protector for iPad that makes you feel like you're actually writing on paper. They use NanoDot technology, which is spread over the surface of the protector, which adds resistance and grip to your pencil inputs, removing that unnatural feeling of writing on glass and replacing it with that familiar papery feel. Now on version 2.1, Paperlike is better than it's ever been before. Made in collaboration with a Swiss-based manufacturer with new material composites, the distribution of those nanodots is a lot more accurate and the plastic used is way thinner making it a notable step up in picture clarity. Also, if you're an avid Apple Pencil user like I am, then your new pencil grips in charcoal from Paperlike are also worth checking out. These come in pairs, with one being designed for either long writing or drawing sessions to reduce grip fatigue, and the other is for more precision-based inputs, giving you the edge when you need to put on those final touches. Each pack comes with both types of grip and works with both Apple Pencil models too. You can get all of this with a cleaning kit in the Pro Pack, or buy them separately. So I'll leave a link in the description below if you want to check any of this out. And of course, a huge thank you goes out to Paperlike for sponsoring this video. All right, let's talk about the iPad Pro series. And obviously these iPads go hard. They've kind of got the best of the best. And if that's what you want from an iPad, then you should potentially start here. One of the main differences and flagship features here for the Pro models is the 120 Hertz screen, which is the ProMotion screen, and it is absolutely wonderful to use. It just means everything you do is super smooth and super responsive, and if you use the Apple Pencil, if you're a drawer or a note taker or anyone like that, you will feel the difference absolutely immediately. Also, the 12.9 inch model has the mini LED display, which is way more contrasty, and it goes completely black in certain areas when you're not using it, which just means the colors and everything that bounces off that screen are incredible. I use it a huge amount to check these videos before I put them live, but if you're an artist or if you're a video maker or anybody like that, you will find that really, really useful. The screens also have a hover feature with the Apple Pencil as well, which is kind of nothing new in the tech space, but it's kind of an interesting thing when you hover your iPad Pencil over a tool or something, it will highlight what it's gonna do, it will show what's going to happen before it does happen which is kind of a nice little add-on feature as well. The pro amenities don't end there either. You're getting face ID for unlocking the iPad. You're getting a ultra wide camera on the back as well as the normal one and a LiDAR scanner. So you can scan 3D environments really neatly. The USB-C is Thunderbolt 4 enabled and way faster than anything else below this one. And the speakers on here are not only way louder, but they also sound way better too, which is really awesome. Obviously you're getting the pro level accessory. So Apple Pencil 2 support is a given as is the Magic Keyboard. That is also combined with Apple's M2 chip, which is just insane to have that inside an iPad. You're also getting up to 16 gigabytes of RAM and in a tablet, that's just wild. Because of that M series chip as well, you're getting all of those extra features which came with the Air. So full external monitor support up to 6K with this one, which is just mad. And you're also getting stage manager for that true windowed multitasking on the iPad. These iPads start at 899 pounds here in the UK, and they balloon all the way up to 3,197 pounds if you decide to go all out on one of the 12.9 inch models, which is absolutely insane. So I really think you've got to have a very specific reason to go for one of the pro models, especially if you decide on maxing it out or upgrading it a little bit. Plugging these iPads into my scale, I'd say they kind of jump over pretty much everything else. I'd say they're still good for higher end creators and then just professionals. But I think for everybody else, all of the earlier iPads, especially the Air, is potentially the way to go. I also wanted to mention that I really think pre-owned iPads are well worth checking out, especially on Apple's website on their refurbished thing. First off, you can get an iPad Air 4th gen, which is the one that came before this, which still has an A14 chip, has Apple Pencil 2 support, a laminated screen and all of that, and that's cheaper than the current iPad 10th gen. And I would argue that that's potentially a better iPad over the iPad 10th gen, so that's definitely worth checking out. You can also pick up an iPad Pro with the M1 chip, which is a year old now, which is still a fantastic chip. It's still a current chip for the current iPad Air. And that starts at 669 pounds on Apple's website. And that is potentially a better buy than the current Air. So that's worth looking into too. 
And an example I can give you is I recently picked up the iPad mini again, but I managed to get this for £340 from CEX here in the UK, which is almost a £200 difference. And they're cheaper on Apple's refurbished website as well. So please do check all of that sort of thing before you just go in straight to the new stuff because you can find some really good deals on there. Before this video is over, I wanted to tell you what I think I would personally buy because I've used all of the iPads. I have this weird kind of access to all of them. But if I were to start again and to buy something completely brand new, I would currently buy the iPad Air because I think that gives you kind of like 90% of the iPad experience of everything possible. It's going to stay fast for years. It's going to have access to all of the pro level accessories if I needed them. And I think it just kind of gives you the best bang for your buck iPad at the moment, even though it's still quite expensive. But if we're looking at pre-owned ones, I would actually buy one from Apple's refurbished website and I would get the iPad Pro in either the 11 or the 12.9 inch versions, but last year's one. So I'd buy the M1 edition because they're just so much cheaper and they're such a decent iPad. You get access to absolutely everything with them. And I know that getting one with the M1 chip or higher is just going to future proof that iPad. I do a lot of work on an iPad. I talk about iPads a lot. I kind of need one up in that area. So that's absolutely where I would go. Okay, that wraps up this iPads buyer's guide. I hope it was useful for you. I hope you got some information from it and you got a clearer idea of what you should get now if you're thinking of picking one up. Or maybe you totally disagree with me or you've got some other advice. Put it in the comments below. I always love to hear what you have to say. And as always, I'll see you all in the next one.